East Aurora, home of the Fighting Tomcats. West Aurora, home of the Fighting Blackhawks. East Aurora and West Aurora is known as one of the longest football rivalries in the state of Illinois. Both of these teams have had memorable games and players that made this rivalry so special in Aurora. From Glenn Thompson, Ken Zimmerman, Roy Davis, and other East and West coaches and players helped evaluate both football programs to the next level. We will look through this historical rivalry, the memorable games, players, and the key events that make East and West Aurora one of the greatest high school football rivalries in Illinois. Well, there is always a non-football rivalry between East Aurora and West Aurora, both sides of the river, just as communities. And the first documented game that we know played between students of each high school was in 1887. It was an unofficial game. It was um, organized by students to raise money for a uh, hospital drive. Uh, the city was trying to build a new hospital back then. And so the schools met on Hertz Island. They, students sold tickets for 25 cents a piece. They sold about 400 tickets, raised $100 for the hospital. The first official game though came in 1893 when East played West. That was the first year that both schools were playing football uh, in an official capacity representing their schools and East beat West 28 to nothing on November 18, 1893. Early in the, the middle of the 1800s, Aurora was a, a separate community from West Aurora. Aurora was uh, on the east side of the river and West Aurora was its own village on the east side of the river, on the west side of the river. And East Aurora School District 131 was the first free public school district in the state of Illinois. And a year later, the West Aurora District 129 um, was, became a public school district as well. just started with people wearing ribbons and buttons of their school colors, red and black for east, red and blue for west. They would decorate wagons, which today we would call floats, but remember back in the early, in the 1800s, there were no cars. Um, people would decorate their wagons and pull them into the, on the Herds Island and surround the field with, uh, with their decorated wagons. Um, there were always, you know, through the years there were bonfires. Uh, Thanksgiving week was also East-West week in a lot of those years and it was a big week-long fest uh, celebration. Um, also, you know, one of the big other traditions was fights. It was so intense back then that there would, there would be rivalries, rivalry fights, okay? And the police would have to be called and they would have to post police officers at both bridges so nobody could get over from one side of town to the other side of town. The police actually would close the bridges between um, that, that, that crossed the river at night so that <laughs> students wouldn't go to the other side just looking for fights. Um, and a lot of the fights were, you know, driven by, instigated by adults as well. Back then, there were no JV, varsity, freshman, or sophomore football teams. Instead, the football teams were split into two groups, the heavyweight football team and the lightweight football team. The rules were different as well. First of all, the football field was 110 yards instead of 100 yards. Second, there were no end zone lines. Third, forward passes were illegal up until 1906. Four, it took five yards to get a first down instead of 10. And lastly, touchdowns were worth four points and the extra points were worth two points. Also, the field goal was worth five points. But that wasn't the only thing that was different in the rivalry. In the very earliest days, they were clubs, and usually they would be, um, the clubs would be overseen by an adult, 
um, often a teacher but not always, uh, who would run practices. But students or other people associated with the team would schedule the games. Um, they, there were no conferences. They could play pretty much uh, whoever they wanted. And often schedules were made up on the fly um, so that teams could pick and choose who they were going to play and you get more evenly matched um, games over the course of the, the season. A huge tradition that was part of the East-West football rivalry was their annual Turkey Bowl games that started way back in 1902. Thanksgiving games were very popular uh, in colleges and some larger high schools throughout the 1800s. They were started in, uh, in colleges and uh, in Aurora, East and West played on and off on Thanksgiving throughout the 1890s. Uh, but it was a tradition that they wanted to keep and in 1902, the two schools agreed that they would play on Thanksgiving and they kept that tradition every year from 1902 until 1951. So a total of 50 consecutive Thanksgivings the two schools played um, in the afternoon on that day. It was mainly held, West Aurora was a town in itself. East Aurora was a town in itself. Okay. So what they would do is they would have one football game and the, they, they didn't want to have it on the east side, they didn't want to have it on the west side. We had a central island in the middle of the river called Herd's Island. And that's when they were having. They would have it during the Thanksgiving. Most of the games were done during the Thanksgiving time, okay, or week, I should say. Herd's Island is now a park in downtown Aurora, right by North Avenue. But back then, it was a place where both East and West played their Turkey Bowl games. On to players, there were a lot of people that were part of this huge rivalry, such as. Howard Fleaver, Frank Slaker, Frank the Duke Haney, Henry Bulger, and many more. But no one had a huge impact on the East-West football rivalry than Glenn Thompson. Anybody that knows any of the, of the coaching or the history from East Aurora, we used to have a coach, we coached here for 18 years. His name was Glenn Thompson. They used to call him Colonel Glenn Thompson. Uh, most of the people, when they'd go to uh, have a game against East Tide, it was always Tommy's Cats, after Glenn Thompson, uh -huh. Tommy's Cats, and then they just shortened it to Tom Cats. Glenn Thompson was a, a, just a giant among men as a football coach. He came to East Aurora from Escanaba, Michigan. He had been a great college athlete at Ripon College in Michigan. Um, and he was a real disciplinarian, and when he arrived in the mid-1920s, um, he took over a team that had had a series of short-tenured coaches, and he immediately put some discipline into it. He was a guy who, because he was such a great athlete, and he was still a young man at that point, um, he would put on his, uh, put on his pads and during practice and get out there and mix it up with the kids, um, just to show them how he really wanted things done. Another innovator that was part of the East-West football rivalry was East's very own Roy E. Davis. Roy Davis was a real, real innovator um, and so key to so many of the things that um, the, the development of sports at East Aurora. He came to East Aurora, I think he arrived in 1913 as a biology teacher. Prior to that, he had taught um, at what is now Michigan State University. He had taught at Eastern Illinois University. Um, came to Aurora to accept this job as a biology teacher at East. And within a very short period of time, he assumed the part-time unpaid duties of athletic director. And he did so many things for, uh, for the school. He, when the railroad cut across Herd's Island, which is where both teams played all their football games, and um, East was gonna have to have uh, new athletic fields, he organized the fundraising, the fundraising drive, and he um, helped purchase the property and then oversaw the construction of the field, which is where the field stands today. That field was built by uh, Roy Davis. In 1929, he had, it was, he had the idea of bringing lights um, to Aurora. There was only one school at that, up to that point that had lights, and that was down in Southern Illinois, so he introduced night football to Northern Illinois University. To North, Northern <laughs> Illinois, and um, um, and so he was just so instrumental in all sorts of innovative things, and um, that's why the field is named after him. Roy D 
game is with the athletic director here at East High. Uh, I can't remember what the amount of years he was here, but he was here a long time. He was very, very instrumental in, in getting our, our football teams, our sports going here. Uh, and then uh, the field, of course, outside is named after him, the Roy E. Davis football field at East High. On the west side, a former coach that was a huge part of this rivalry was Ken Zimmerman. So Ken Zimmerman was a very beloved coach. He coached uh, at West for 26 years. He arrived from Woodstock High School. He had had a very successful playing career at the University of Illinois. Um, he also coached the freshman at University of Illinois um, for one season, then coached at a couple of high schools, including Woodstock, and finally landed at uh, West Aurora for the 1944 season. That first year, they were three and six. Um, 1945 wasn't really that much better. Um, but in 1946, they were, um, the Blackhawks were 10-0-0. And, and then uh, they would be undefeated uh, or have one loss again in 48 and 49. So over a four-year period, his teams lost only a handful of games. And in three of those years, they were, um, only lost one game. Um, and he coached all the way until 1970. Um, in, our, in 19, 1970, and then in 1971 he coached the first game of the season, but then decided he was burnt out and he just retired, very abruptly retired um, and, and left coaching. Well, it was a long time coming, and, and then really the sort of disintegration or the downslide of football in Aurora started way back in the 19 early 1980s um, and it was a combination of things it was um, just sort of a lack of interest um, you had demographics were changing in town um, a lot of immigrants from Mexico came they weren't really tied to the high schools and the community like um, like the people that came earlier were um, they really didn't play football um, and more importantly though there were um, a lot of youth programs just didn't keep up with the times um, there were junior high youth programs earlier, uh, and middle school youth programs, and, and some those were not very consistent or very well coached at times anymore. Uh, the park district programs didn't really exist, and so there was it wasn't until high school that um, kids who wanted to play football were really getting trained, and um, and that really set both programs back quite a bit. Today, there are two former players from both East and West that are coaching both football teams. The first is West Aurora coach Nate Eimer. I've been in sports probably since uh, I was like three or four years old, you know, uh, picking up a basketball and football and baseball. So, yeah, quite a while, a <laughs> long time. <laughs> On a football scholarship out to a Division II school in Pennsylvania called Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. So. Yeah, I went and played out there for uh, five years. I got redshirted as a freshman, um, and yeah. Trying to rebuild the West program um, by really emphasizing and trying to get his kids involved at a younger age in youth football programs, even if he has to send them out of Aurora. And um, I mean, it seems like after last year, the way the um, Blackhawks finished the uh, 2014 season, like he might be on the cusp of putting together a program. They've got a... Um, a really good group of athletes right now um, who finished the year winning four of their last five games um, and a lot of those kids are coming back um, so there's reason for opti optimism on the west side. I mean I think the first one is just kind of changing the culture you know mm -hmm. um, you know because we've had a culture of uh, not doing things the right way for you know for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing obviously is to make the playoffs you know which we haven't done yet um, and then you know become a team that competes year in and year out for a conference championship and then hopefully a state championship you know but you just got to go day by day, you know, and also I think developing a culture where kids want to continue to play when they're done in high school, you know, because that obviously means you're doing something right when they want to continue to play this game in college. Then there's Kurt Becker, a former East Aurora player and a former Chicago Bear. Kurt Becker graduated from here in 1977. Uh, he played football here. Uh, I think, if I remember right, that was Dick Schindel's last year here, and Kurt Becker was one of his players. Uh, he was recruited heavily by Bo Schim uh, Schimbeck, Schimbeck from uh, Michigan or Wisconsin, and he went there. After he left there, he uh, was a member of the Bears organization, the 1985 Bears Super Bowl team. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt is now back here 
a good friend of mine. I talk to him a lot. Uh, I help him as much as I can with the, whatever he needs for the team and that. Uh, he's the head football coach here in East. So far, um, sledding's been a little bit tough. Mm -hmm. um, they've won a couple of games during his three-year tenure, um, but it's hard to look at the varsity and really see an improvement, except in numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the games and the scores are getting closer, but they're not quite, haven't quite turned the corner where they've won, won a lot of games yet. But the one thing that uh, Kurt Becker has done is to institute a youth football program that starts in, the, in grade school. And um, though that program, which is three years in now, it's been growing every year, and the, the results have been better and better each year. They had uh, one of their teams played for the Chicagoland Championship in their age bracket last year. Um, so it'll be a couple more years before those kids hit high school. But at least, you know, but when they do, um, you know, at that point, you know, he's going to have some real talent to work with and some kids who have played football like so many other communities since they were 8, 9, 10 years old. It's tradition. It's because, the you know, so many people who um, lived and grew up in Aurora and are still in Aurora remember it. Um, it was a big deal for them. Uh, you know, and it goes way back to when the games were played on Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving week was a, a huge deal and it ended, you know, on Wednesday night there would be bonfires and pep rallies on both sides of town and, and, and that tradition just continued. Um, and schools all over the country have rivalries. Um, this one just happens to be ours and mm -hmm. it's the oldest one in the state of Illinois. I'm you know, just continuing to play each year and continuing to draw the crowds that we draw, you know, no matter what the record. Um, and then just the strong school pride, you know, in both places, I think. I mean, I can't speak for East Aurora, but I can speak on what I see. You know, what I see is that a lot of people, you know, stick around for a long time and root for those Tomcats, you know, and it's the same way here. I mean, there's people that don't even have kids in the program that come back every Friday night, you know, and watch us play, and uh, I think that's what makes it so special. It's school against school, but it's the same town. We're, you know, we're divided, divided by the river. Okay, as they say. Yeah. But we're a whole city in one. Yeah. So I think five years from now, you know, we could be looking at a couple of teams that have been much better than we've seen in the last 20 or 20.